right, we'll go ahead and get started uh, as people are filtering in. Um, thank you and welcome uh, to uh, Unimed's Innovation Week. And here we're going to discuss, uh, I guess we're tentatively calling it adventures in starting up. So hopefully we learn some lessons and provide some guidance for those who might want to take a similar path. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say that uh, we have a couple of more events uh, coming up this week. Uh, tomorrow we have a probably a pretty good follow-up panel which gets into some of the resources that might be available to entrepreneurs and, and people looking to start up. Um, so that'll be again at noon um, on a Zoom link and you can check the website uh, unimed.com slash innovation dash week um, for a full calendar of events there. And then on when, or excuse me, on Thursday, we kind of wrap things up with our innovation awards. And those events are open and free to, to anyone who wants to join us. So um, be sure to check those out. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first is a way of introduction for the panel. Uh, we have uh, Doug Miller with us, who is the CEO of a new startup called Empower, uh, which is uh, one of my favorite technologies that I've seen come through Unimed. It's a self-pacing treadmill, and it's every bit as cool as it sounds, right? Um, so look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and also, Doug, he has a background in the uh, fitness industry. Um, was it, uh, I'm sorry, refresh my memory, it was life. Life fitness. Life fitness. So, so yep. if you have ever been on a treadmill, it was probably a life fitness machine. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, Abby Rakes is with us, too. Um, she is a professor at the College of Public Health and is the founder of ECD Measure, um, which um, looks into uh, building early childhood and education care. Um, yeah, maybe you got a better uh, elevator pitch than I just brutalized that, Abby. Can, can you help us out? Uh, yeah, we're focused on improving the quality of child care settings uh, through better monitoring and feedback. So that's a great elevator pitch. How long did it get you to, uh, to settle in on that? I, it was, you know, I'll say it was actually pretty straightforward. Uh, okay. Because that, that's what we do. <laughs> so. How about you, Doug? Let's hear your elevator pitch. I mean, how important is that, first of all, to have a good elevator pitch? It takes more time than you think because you tend to fall in love with your first idea. And when you find out the first 10 or 20 people you tell it to, they go, huh? So ours is making uh, fitness technology that works for you, not against you, because treadmills today, you have to keep up with it rather than it tracking your speed. Right. Yeah, there's no, there's no inputs with, with your, right. You just, you slow up you, or you slow down, you speed up the, the treadmill adjusts to you without any other inputs. Right. Yes. That's pretty great. Um, I think to get started, um, I, I think uh, I don't want to get too deep into, you know, background and story and, and the company. I, I think I think more people might be interested in learning just how to get started. I mean, so with that thought, Doug, you're, we have you on screen. So could you tell us more about um, maybe one of the one or two things you wished you knew as you got started into this? I, mean, I, I saw that Jason just jumped in. Do we want to? Uh, yeah, we'll come to him in a second. Um, okay. We'll come around to him. One or two things I wish I knew coming in. The, what I learned is knowing your weaknesses coming in will help you overcome a lot of the challenges sooner rather than later. When you're starting a company, usually it's just you or just you and a couple of other key people. And in my case, long, long history in technology both in fitness and in communication in general, time at Life Fitness, as we mentioned before, but also a couple of decades at Motorola. So the technology challenges weren't hard. I had never done sales. I had worked with sales. I had talked to sales a lot. I'd never done that job. I had never done the marketing side. So coming up with elevator pitches, marketing decks, creating from nothing, you know, tended to cause some of my biggest delays. And I was fortunate to have a, a great support group through the Unitech office to help me work through a lot of those issues. But ultimately it came down, you know, in most cases it came down to me to putting in the legwork. So identifying my weaknesses, helping to ask the right questions to overcome them was one of the early bottlenecks that I had to address. 
Okay. You, you mentioned Unitech. Unitech is the uh, startup incubators based on uh, out of the university here in town. Um, Abby, uh, how about you? The uh, one or two things that maybe you wished you knew when you got started? So I, I think that one of the points that you mentioned really quickly already um, resonates, which is the difference between research that generates a certain solution and a product that's workable uh, commercially. And sometimes that's that those two things are what really one and the same. And then other times you have a good lead, but you need to iterate and you need to uh, change and be flexible as you move forward. So I think that, I, that the shift from the academic mindset to the startup mindset has both been exciting and fun, but also for my team and I has required us to, um, to learn a lot as we go. So I think that that's, that's been one of our biggest lessons learned. And we also have really benefited from Unitech and uh, from Unimed and the support that we've received uh, from the university community. Okay, we're also joined by uh, Jason Johanny, who's a uh, vascular surgeon at UNMC. Uh, he started a company called uh, Future Assure, which is a way to uh, pre-screen, I guess, uh, patients before surgery as a way to make sure they're healthy enough to undergo the procedure. Is that a fair description, Dr. Johanny? Yes, it is. Yeah, we're, our, our goal is to assure uh, your future medical decisions by uh, performing a uh, rapid risk assessment uh, of both questions as well as physiologic variables. And, uh, you know, to your point, I was thinking about this as the uh, other panelists were speaking. I think a couple of things that I would have wished I would have known earlier. Number one, um, we are sort of isolated in the medical community and the ability to go outside of our university boundaries to really interact with true startups uh, and local startups. We have a lot in Omaha. Uh, so for example, I wish I would have known about Million Cups really early on to go connect with people. Um, uh, and I, I think also uh, the fact that we have a lot of mentors outside of, of the university system who are willing to help out. So I, I think those are the two things to recognize. And, and the, probably the other thing I didn't also think about is in business perspective, people you know, rely on their stature within the community to make connections and to push things. We, we often are looked at as, well, that's sort of potentially egotistical and you know, you're, you're using your clout and your stature. Well, that's very common and needed when you're doing a startup. And, and I've, I wish I would have capitalized on that a lot earlier. So, and I'm going to be moving around a little bit. So ignore the, all, all the video, I'll stay on video for everybody. But uh, the other thing I've learned with startups and entrepreneurial is you, you got to go and meet, meet where you're needed. So I'm going to be moving around a little bit. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, doctor. Um, as we uh, uh, moving on, then, if um, I, you know, somewhere along the similar lines, and maybe this is the same question, but if it is, just you know, <laughs> ignore it, I suppose. But I, I'm I'm curious if if you know when you got started, what was the hardest lesson learned? You know, you know, and, and maybe it's the same thing, but you know, there had to be something that that just was really tough to get around. I'm curious, if, Doug. We can start with you. I think for me, the, the, the challenge that I'm still dealing with, that's why I put it in the hardest category, is identifying the actual person, not just the type of person, not just the persona, but a person that needs to be reached. Yeah, you know, all the marketing experience, I got my MBA, everything I learned about identifying personas, target markets, everything else, that's all well and good. And certainly that work needs to be done. But then when you need to start picking up the phone to calling people, it's, it's a whole new level of you know, trying to find somebody at the other end of the email, at the other end of the phone, who will answer the call and take the time is 
my my biggest ongoing challenge is because now we've got again like I said my background is technology and developing and launching technology so that part I've done those steps time and again but when it comes to reaching out to potential investors to potential customers to potential clients it's easy enough to say oh it would be this type of gym or this type of rehab center okay pick up the phone and call one of them or reach out and you know set up an email campaign you need to have an actual body at the other end and finding them and and getting them to respond is you can't take that for granted yeah. that's interesting abby how about you uh so i think sort of uh reflecting on the themes that doug just raised that it's also for us, like we have really put a lot of emphasis on trying to understand childcare providers and the people who are supporting them to build products that take science, but then also make them attractive and workable for the people who are actually caring for kids on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the area that I work in, there have there's been um, some degree of like sort of top down thinking of this is what you should do. This is the right set of evidence behaviors that you should adopt. And that that the science behind it is good. Uh, so I'm not really questioning that so much, but rather how does that look to the person who's actually caring for kids on a day to day basis? Who is that market that we're searching for? Who are we trying to help do a better job? Um, and how do we engage them in the process? So my team and I have used human-centered design uh, techniques, and, and we're in the process of doing that now. So we have spent hours interviewing child care providers, observing them, talking with them, um, all as a part of trying to understand more deeply uh, what they need. Um, and I, I think that uh, for us, then, that's kind of the key question is, okay, so we have a, decades of science. Now, what are we going to do with that? And how do we get people to actually start behaving in ways that are consistent with the science? It almost sounds like that type of you know, that identification, if you will, almost seems like an afterthought, but it seems to be a critical piece that, that is easily overlooked, perhaps. Yeah, well, and, and I, I do think that, uh, mm -hmm. that there are some creative tensions, I guess, with the typical way that, uh, that we do research. I'm, I'm trained in the social sciences and you know, it really, we have a very positivist approach, like here's a theory, and now we're gonna go out and test the theory. And that's a very different frame than saying, I'm gonna spend time studying this person's behavior and understand how I can build in something that will help them achieve their goals more effectively. Like those are two different paradigms. Yeah. And they're both valuable paradigms, but I think the key, especially in these types of of um, creative spaces between universities and startups is like, well, how do you find that intersection? Like where, what's in that Venn diagram? Um, and how do you build paradigms and skill sets on both sides so that people actually want to use what you're creating? Well, Dr. Ghani, um, I, I guess I'd put the same question to you. Um, you know, what has been the toughest lesson learned for you in getting your company going? So, so a couple of things. I think biggest one for me is uh, showing a prototype proof of concept. You know, that's one that I found that once I had that in hand, all of a sudden uh, things started happening. And the other hardest thing to swallow too was uh, I had to commit my own finances to, to it. And w that's important from the perspective of you know, it, we always think about things in university and the research, well, we get the research dollars. Whereas the business world thinks about it a little bit different of, well, how committed are you to the project that you're involved in? Are you willing to commit your own? It's one thing to commit time, but it's another thing to commit resources. The other thing that I would just uh, allude to along these lines, and I sort of knew this from just having interacted uh, as a vascular surgeon on the device side, seeing Tom Fogarty, who was one of the original entrepreneurs out at Stanford and knowing some people at entrepreneurial uh, sites that are university oriented is, uh, I really had to battle the, the prevailing uh, sort of 
approach of, well, why would you ever want to do anything entrepreneurial? Whereas I knew my colleagues at other sites where, oh my gosh, you're doing something entrepreneurial. That's like kick ass. We need to support you. And so I, I bring that up because I think that's really a, a significant factor when you're starting out is if you're not, if you don't feel supported, uh, it, it can get really uh, tough at times to, you know, continue on. Imagine that's, that's compounded by the amount of extra time. I mean, how much, you know, when you factor in, I, I know you're, I'm sure you're putting in plenty of hours, work-life balance probably doesn't even exist for you anymore, does it? Oh, it does. Uh, and I think that's something to be saying, uh, even the entrepreneurs that I meet who are like serial entrepreneurs, they are very protective of their work-life balance. Uh, I think the key that I've seen and what's really made me focus is, uh, and this is something that Dr. Markin and Dr. Linder impressed upon me early on, which is companies used to be stood up in four to five years and now the average is five to seven years and you you can never run a five to seven year sprint it needs to be a marathon mm -hmm. so you know uh i i always look every single day to say what did i do to forward my ventures today in some fashion no matter how small but what what did i do what email did i send what um connection did i make what uh you know, like later today, I'm meeting with my uh, legal team to finalize an LLC. So th there's always something and it doesn't, you know, for example, that meeting will take an hour. So yeah, it's a little extra time, but man, that pushes my company that much further ahead when I have an organized LLC with a dedicated team. That's, that's great. That's really interesting. Um, you mentioned Dr. Uh, Linder, Jim Linder. He's the former CEO of uh, Unimed, actually. He's now um, CEO at uh, Nebraska Medicine. You also mentioned Rod Markin, who's the director at Unitech, the uh, startup incubator. So thanks, Dr. Johanning. We got uh, James Hermson is with us now. We had some technical difficulties earlier. I'm glad you can get on, James. Uh, James is a local entrepreneur. Um, he's done um, a lot of work with, always oh, a sub uh, co-founder of uh, the Saw Hermson strap, which is a really clever design to help um, uh, hold like eyeglasses or surgical loops uh, more securely to a, a person's head. Uh, the glasses are really interesting because it, it helps with children who have uh, who have born with uh, some sort of um, birth defects. For example, maybe they don't have an ear or the their ears are not level, and so glasses don't quite fit like they would for uh, for us. Uh, Hermson, can you um, James? Can you tell us your elevator pitch for this saw uh, Hermson strap? All right, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so the strap, I'll grab a sample. Real, real quickly, uh, attaches to loops that are used by dentists and surgeons. Uh, the weight of the magnifiers uh, creates stress on the nose and the ears and the strap displaces that weight to the back of the head. And so it, it frees up surgeons to not worry about their their loops sliding down their head and which uh, helps alleviate uh, the stress to their bodies associated with that. Uh, it's a pretty simple design. That's Great. kind of it in a nutshell. It's, mm -hmm. it's a pretty simple concept. Uh, so the, um, as you got that, uh, you, you, I know you had a, a nice, I, I imagine you still work with Dr. Saw, although he's, uh, he's moved on to, I think he's in Stanford now. Um, but, uh, you know, can you think back to some of the biggest challenges you had as you got that, that piece going? Well, this, for me, this was, was founded off another business that was sunglasses and kids eyewear that uh, I made a lot of mistakes with uh, trying to develop that. So this is a, something that was spawned out of another company that actually failed. And uh, I made a lot, a lot of mistakes. Uh, for me, I tried to do everything myself and uh, I've learned since then that it really takes a team and it takes a team of skilled individuals and literally I tried to do everything on my own and uh, you can't really grow a company uh, that way and then having access to capital trying to fund it on your own invest your own money into it uh, 
for me, uh, once I discovered the Center for Emerging Advanced Technology at Metro Community College, that gave me access to capital for a very small price. And I was able to develop this and then we were able to bring it to the market. And that really created the opportunity for us to produce this and create the units uh, without having access to that capital. I, I would have had to maybe seek out some kind of venture capital to buy the equipment. And then I would have uh, not been able to become profitable as quickly, so. Okay. Um, have you, um, can you think about the, the, the hardest lesson? Maybe it's the same, maybe the same answer, but I want to make sure we cover the same ground with you that we did with, with the other panelists. Um, can you think back to what maybe was your hardest lesson learned? Perhaps that's the same answer. Well, it's very similar. That's for sure. Um, you know, once again, uh, finding a, a good team and, 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 uh, trying not to do everything yourself, for, for, at least for me. Um, I, I come from skilled carpentry background and I'm used to doing all aspects of my business on my own. And so uh, bringing in, uh, you know, developing a team with Unimed for one and, and trusting that that's gonna be the right path for me, uh, along with Dr. Saw, um, really, uh, was was huge and and seeing the value in, in other people and what they're going to bring to your business and uh, not be fearful of bringing in other people but do your due diligence of trying to create a team that that shares your same mission and uh and the goals and that's also very passionate about what you're doing uh, i think that's that's very important as well um just having passion isn't really enough you need people that all that also believe in your passion and that um, that have that bring value to uh, your mission and your goals, and then you also have to be willing to make sacrifices to bring bring in team members, um, maybe by um, you know sharing sharing the proceeds of royalties or wealth or however you want to say it. Um, but everybody is a a big part of uh, the big picture, and realizing that you just it's not just you about you. Um, it's really about the whole team that's, that's created it. So I really, uh, Unimed has been uh, very, very important for, for the success of this process. Uh, their their uh, visibility in the, in the marketplace, uh, so much more rewarding than trying to find a, a, a private patent attorney and for us to try to do this on our own. Uh, so it's, that's been a huge learning experience for me. And, uh, you know, hats off to everyone at Unimed, Tyler Scher, and your entire staff. Uh, really, this wouldn't have happened without them. And now we have thousands and thousands of, of dentists and surgeons benefiting from it. So, oh, great, great. Now I got to, now Tyler's going to think he's special. What are we saying? <laughs> he is. <laughs> he is. Um, so, I uh, want to bring it back to you. Before I continue on, uh, for, for, our, for our viewers and listeners, um, just so you know, we, this will be recorded. Uh, we're going to post it so that others can access it later on. We might even use it to help future entrepreneurs that work with us. So, um, so just know that that resource will be available. Also, if you have questions, um, go ahead and send a chat to me or to the group, um, and then I'll try to fit them in as, as I can. Um, I want to get back to, to Doug uh, with Empower. Um, Doug, the, uh, I'm curious. Um, I don't know, maybe this is kind of me kind of rubbernecking a wreck on the side of the road, but I'm curious, what was the worst advice you got? I think the, the worst advice is you can pay somebody to do that. And you can. Uh, like case in point, my, my pitch decks were, were lagging at some point. I got some really good advice from the other team at Unitech. They helped me come up with something. Uh, but as I shared it with some potential investors and they poo pooed it, it's like, you should pay somebody to clean that up for you. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, you know, check my pants again, no money in the pockets. <laughs> so just know and expect that unless you get some investors early or like Dr. Hanning mentioned, if, if you're self-funding, you have to make those calls. It's a lot easier when you're in a big business 
yeah, when with with large budgets to to justify shelling out money for those type of things, but most and yeah, I'm curious to see the other two panelists with their finding. But if until or unless you have funding, be thoughtful on what types of things you are going to outsource or figure out a way to get it done yourself. Abby, what about you? What was the worst advice you got? You know, I, I think I would characterize it as crickets, meaning that we had a hard time convincing people, helping them understand, like childcare is a $54 billion industry in the US. And, and people were sort of like, oh, childcare, okay. And so I think that in some ways, the worst advice would be to stop if you don't immediately get a response that you're looking for. I think people understand some things better than others and that's totally fine. Uh, but just because you don't have an idea that somebody immediately jumps on doesn't mean that it's not a great idea. Um, and so it's, in, it's, it's the persistence, I think. So that, that the, um, yeah, so the worst advice I got, uh, I suppose, is um, of, of listening to silence. <laughs> like don't, oh. don't, don't listen to the silence for too long. Sure, if you try several times and it still doesn't work out, like maybe it's really not a good idea. But for us, it was really just a question of helping people understand exactly how big the childcare market is and how much it can benefit from new solutions. Okay, uh, Dr. Jahadi? Yeah. Um... Apologize for no video, but uh, I'll be done with my commute here in a second. Um, I would say the biggest or, or worst piece of advice I received is just no advice. You know, the uh, I, I, when I started on this and said, I want to do this, um, I went to some people who, you know, were good uh, mentors and guided me. But the one thing I did not realize is that there is a lot of basically literature guidance out there now with regards to being an entrepreneur, being a serial entrepreneur. Um, I think, for example, the take on the teams, I think is very important. Uh, but also from an entrepreneurial perspective, uh, knowing exactly when to bring a team in and how you are going to compensate and negotiate that, I think is uh, getting to be more and more well described in the literature per se. And so the, the one thing that I would have done uh, and the crickets um, comment was much appreciated, which is um, don't just accept it, go out and find out what you need to know uh, and really seek it out because I think that it was the void of entrepreneurship uh, that I struggled with the most. James, um, how about you? Worst advice you got? You get a lot of advice and, um, uh, you know, not for me, it's like not everybody is going where I want to end up. And so you get a lot of advice that people give you and it's about where the, what, what their vision is and where they want to end up and does it really apply to you? And so you have to, um, you know, really discern what, what advice is good advice and, and what advice is, is not relevant. And many people will give you advice, but they have no track record. So, um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, not sure if there's really like any worse advice, but I got a lot of advice and just really discerning um, which is good and bad and going with your gut feeling, I guess. Okay. Um, you know, I, imagine I, I was just gonna chime in on what he said. That's the other thing either. Sometimes it feels like Abby said, either no advice or so much advice and it's conflicting. And then you have to decide, all right, which of these am I gonna listen to? So what do you do in that situation? If you get a lot of different, a lot of people coming at you from different directions, how do you, how do you find the right path? Start so with you, I, Doug. Or Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to comment on that because I think that, that that is, that is key. Everybody is going to have advice for you, 
And the one thing that in reading about entrepreneurs is everybody has a different path. And that's why a lot of people like being an entrepreneur is you get to forge your own path. And so from an advice standpoint, what I've learned is that you need to take away from these people's journeys, what worked, the inflection points that made them successful, uh, and what, what specifically, even though it's not your perspective, what can you take away from what their experience was and apply it to your endeavor to make you successful? Doug, were you gonna were you gonna add to that? Or no, I think I think to accentuate, I fully agree with Dr. Jahani that you have to look at where it's coming from, where the advisor might be guiding you from. If it's something they're very fluent in and I'm not, I'll probably give it more credence. If like in my case, the self-pacing treadmill is fitness-based. So if it's somebody from a completely different industry, I have to think twice, am I being too short-sighted if I don't give it credence because it's outside of my market, but, and, and you know, give it that thought, just don't follow it blindly. Okay. Abby, did you wanna, you're talking about the crickets being an issue um, for you, but I imagine at some point you did get the advice and did you have to have, make those kind of choices that we were talking about a minute ago? I, sure, yes. I mean, I, I think um, that for us, uh, we were pretty specific about the areas where we needed advice. And so uh, we did get different points of view, but, you know, kind of as you do with everything in your life, you can sort of, you know, you take the source into account, as others have said, and you weigh the pros and cons. I, I think that some of it is just pretty deeply intuitive. And, you know, you do the best you can. You try to take the information that you've got and then you make a choice and you, on some level, hope that it was the right choice. It was the one that you made. And, um, and we, we have, in some ways, um, one of our bigger challenges that I didn't mention earlier is finding a tech developer who understood our market well enough uh, to be able to build a good product for us. So we've really had to just rely on our own instincts um, in, in interviewing people and talking to people about how best to go forward. Uh, so, um, so that I would say that it's been more intuition than anything else. Um, one other thing though, that could be useful to people on the call, in the space that I work in, there's actually a venture network focused only on early childhood because I think there's a need that there should be more um, startups and more entrepreneurial ventures focused on early childhood. So the, those types of networks are also really useful um, and, uh, and helped us sort through some of the differing opinions that we got on different issues. But in general, I would say that, that Unimed and Unitech together, we relied on a lot and it hasn't been that conflicted, it's just been useful. Okay, all right. Um, uh, James, did you wanna add anything to that part or can we move on? We can move on. Okay. Um, so I'm curious. I, I imagine there's one or two people out there who might be considering taking the same path. Maybe they have their own ideas for a, for a startup company. And I imagine it's a pretty intimidating endeavor to take that first step. Um, what, how do you sell them on this being a good idea? And, what, and then maybe what's, what's the first step they need to take? Uh, we'll start with you, um, Abby. You want to start with you? Uh, sure. Yeah. I I would say that uh, the reasons to do it um, are the first, I mean, this is a particular motivator for me, is that there are so many creative new ideas that come from stepping outside of your discipline, if you're a professor, for example, or academic, and moving into a new space. Like, the, like I said earlier about the shift in frame that comes from entrepreneurship, like has really been a very creative way of looking at problems across the spectrum. So that would be the first. It's a big world, a lot of interesting, exciting things that you can find if you go this path. Um, for us, a very practical reason too um, of going down this road is that it opened up new partnerships and new sources of funding 
and new ways to engage with the end users, the beneficiaries. So we work in low and middle income countries as well as in the US. And we have had clients from the very beginning. So for us, we, you know, we're sort of building on the client base that we already had. I love the university and I really, really appreciate all of the things that the university does, all the contributions. It is much easier to work outside of the university with some projects and some partnerships. So there was a very real practical piece that had to do with how do we do the best job we can on behalf of all of the people that we're working with. And for us, an entrepreneurial lens made sense. Um, so I think that those are, those are two reasons to jump off and sort of move in that direction. I think embedded in that second one, we also applied for an STTR uh, grant um, this year, which we would not have been able to do had we not started a venture. And um, we were uh, fortunate to receive assistance through the NIH Applicant Assistance Program, and that was really helpful. And so already it sort of opened up some new doors and um, sources of assistance that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So just a few thoughts, thanks. Yeah, sure. You're um, just a, so for some people who, who might not know, STTR refers to a small business technology transfer grants uh, program from the federal government, which is channeled through various agencies, including NIH and and, and stuff like that. Um, is that is that about right, Abby? Is that yes, right? that is right. Yeah, okay. it's there are two versions of them, but yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, Doug, how about you? Um, same question. You know, someone. Uh, what's advice for you know? What do you tell someone who's considering the same leap into uh, into entrepreneurship? I think it aligns with a lot of the things the other panelists and I have been talking about. In you know, make sure that it somehow aligns with your your persona, your ideals. What's going to interest you? Because it's going to be a lot of work. Don't underestimate that. And some days what gets you through that is because you can see where it's going to lead to. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest thing because then it helps you also, can, what's your own personal North Star? Because that's going to help you figure out when you're able to bring other people on, who is it you want to partner with? What, if you're fortunate to work with the university as I and, and the others have been, what are you looking for the university to do? What are you going to do? Where's that trade-off going to go? How is it going to scale long-term? Have make, Get whatever clarity you can up front so you're walking in eyes wide open so that you have a better chance of success downstream. James? Uh, for me, you know, it's like, does your idea or your innovation, does it, does it help people? Does it solve a problem? Um, what, what kind of impact can you have with what you're creating? And is that worth pursuing? And is it also worth uh, giving up other things in your life to pursue that uh, for, the, for the rewards of just not monetary, but also the impact that your company can have, uh, whether it be global health, um, physical health, mental health, um, and, and does it have uh, viability to commercialize it? Are people gonna be willing to pay for it as well? So, and are you passionate about it? Okay. So does it solve a problem really for me and is it worth pursuing to, to solve that problem? It's the greatest motivation because it does help other people. And when you get that feedback, there's the gratitude that comes with it is, is really hard to describe. And um, if you're solving a problem and it, it has an impact, then I would say you wanna go for it. But, but it is like Doug said, it's, it's a lot of work. You have to be willing to invest your own time, your own money, sometimes with uh, not much reward, but you just keep moving forward and eventually things start to fall into place. It doesn't happen quickly uh, and you learn a lot along the way. So, you know, how, how, how badly do you want to see what you created in the world? Okay, Jason, um, 
you know, how about you? And you know, there's somebody on the call here might be thinking about starting their own their own company. What do they need to know? Uh, so it was interesting. I was in a in sort of a, a pitch session um, with a fairly prominent entrepreneur, and probably the biggest uh, kudos I got out of the uh, session was. You know, this person said, well, you have the why. And I think that's the question you have to ask yourself is, why does it matter? Why are you doing it? And the other thing that we talked about was most good entrepreneurial ventures solve some significant pain point for a significant number of people. I think that's the other thing that, uh, you know, what Abby was talking about is, you know, ha, you know, her sector affects everybody. And, you know, in the same way, I look at it and I saw that the decisions that my company wants to address affect everybody. So the, the fact is, is and, and I look at it at, honestly from a medical background is, you know, I wanted to go in to alleviate p- patients' pain, but in sometimes you have to look at the system and say, how can I alleviate the, the system's pain? And can I do it through technology or a novel device that I can capitalize on uh, and, and I think that's the other thing that uh, we have to recognize is, is that you, you're pro- you, you need to produce a product. It's not just simply ideas or research, but at the end of the day, from an entrepreneurial perspective, you've got to have a product to sell. And so those are some of my sort of why and pain are the two. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious, maybe more on a, on a more sort of nuts and bolts kind of level. You know, if I wanted to start a company, it just, it looks like there's a million things to do. Doug, you know, can you give us an idea on what specifically, you know, what are the one or first one or two things, if you want to start a company, what do you, what's the, you know, one of, one of the first two things you maybe you need to do to get going? How do you start? Um, I've started a few companies, not to say that I'm a serial entrepreneur by any means, but Starting an LLC is fairly straightforward. As Dr. Rehaning had said earlier, there's a lot of information out there, starter guides, some states are different than others. That's fairly straightforward. When we did Empower, we knew we wanted to go the Inc. route, be a formal company, because the intent would be to license the technology. And we decided that was what our investors would best be looking for. We spent a little bit of time, you know, because we could have created that ink company in Nebraska. We ultimately ended up doing it through Delaware, mostly just because there's more information available that's more readily accepted. So put some time into figuring out what you're after, what your business is going to do, because that can significantly play out in what type of structure you put together and whether or not you need a bank account and everything else. From my perspective, the early questions were, what's the business gonna do? What do we need in the short term versus the long term to be successful so we could set the company up around that? So uh, Abby, um, what about you? What's uh, what's one of the first couple of things that someone needs to do in a more detailed kind of way? Um, so I, I think a lot of the themes that came up are really good ones. And starting with having a clear purpose of, of how the world will be a better place if you do what it is that you are hoping to do. Um, and, uh, you know, some of it, too, I think uh, for us and our venture, um, I am I wanted to make sure that I had enough money to pay for people's salaries. Like I, I personally felt responsible for you know, who are the people that I need to jump with me and how can I make sure that this is a good experience for them? So um, so I spent a lot of time thinking through uh, 
how we could go about making sure that we had a combination of existing contracts to support the, the things that were a little riskier. I understand that that might not be um, suitable for everybody who might not be in that position. Uh, but for me, one of the values really was like, I, I realize that this is a risk, but I, I really care about the people that I work with. And so how can we do this in a way that's very supportive and allows everybody to do all of their best work? So those were factors that came into play. We, we did the legal pieces. Those were not very hard and um, for us. We didn't, we didn't struggle too much in getting some of those pieces set up. Um, and, and also, you know, that I think just to make sure that everybody who's interested in this might know that the state of Nebraska also offers uh, grants for new ventures of various kinds. And so there are other resources out there. If you are registered in the state of Nebraska, I, I think, I think you might have to be. Uh, so um, just a few additional thoughts into what, in addition to what everybody else said. Okay. Um, uh, James? Um, you know, uh, looking at business structures, uh, how big you want to be. Um, I'm a small company with one employee. And so it, it's, you know, there's setting up uh, the, the structure for me was really easy. I just got on the Secretary of State website, created an LLC, opened a bank account. Um, we created a patent and we were in business. So uh, for, from my perspective anyways, um, it was looking at the different business structures and an LLC sing, uh, was the simplest method, uh, but you do need to put those structures in place uh, and, and see what, what your needs are as a, as a business and how much you're gonna grow, how many employees you're gonna have, things like that. So, um, it was, and I, and I had also had a business previous to that. So I, that was a, a small business and that was an LLC as well. So I had been kind of been through it and then kind of mimicked what I had done for that business and recreated that for, for the strap company. Okay. Um, so it looks like we're, we're running short on time here. Um, we're gonna ask one more question as we go. I don't see a lot of questions here from the group, but um, uh, however, um, maybe there was something that you wanted to talk about. Doug, we'll start with you. Maybe there was something that you wanted to talk about. I didn't ask a good question to get at it. Is there something that was left unsaid that we should we should part with as we as we wrap it up? Yeah, I, I thought the questions were very spot on. I'm trying to think of what the, the audience may still be lacking if they're unsure. And, and my, my parting guidance would be to, if you're thinking about heading down this path, as the other panelists suggested, make sure you have a pretty solid idea of your MVP, your minimum viable product, and what it's gonna take to get there. Is it realistic or not? But if, if you're pretty much there, make sure you get a good set of advisors. I've been very fortunate to work with the, the Unitech team, the team in the University of Nebraska. They've been phenomenal. If, if you don't want to take that route or there, that path isn't available to you, at least make sure you reach out to professors, other trusted people in the area, because you need that sounding board to sometimes just to speak out loud your thoughts, but more likely to get some some outsider opinions and recommendations that you wouldn't necessarily think of. So make sure you get some, some advisors in your corner, uh, either you know, paid or unpaid, depending on your circumstances, but that'll take you a long way. Abby, party thoughts? Um, I think just for, for people who may be in university positions and, and thinking about this, that uh, even with the very good work of Unitech and Unimed, I don't always know that there's a lot of support for these ideas within many of the academic departments. Uh, so I think the last parting word is just to persevere, even if it seems like you're not exactly sure if how you're gonna move forward or, or what you're gonna do, um, that Unimed and Unitech are great sources of information. and 
these types of ventures are really, really important for taking ideas from science and putting them into practice. And so I am hopeful that the university community becomes a little bit more um, aware and supportive of these types of things. But in the meantime, don't give up. Great. Uh, James. You can have a product and idea, but if you don't have any interest out there in the marketplace, then how are you going to generate the interest in the marketplace? How are you going to find a buyer for it? And um, so if you're going to create the, the, the business infrastructure and you don't have any interest, it's almost uh, kind of pointless, you might say. So uh, a big part of it is of your idea and the product is, is doing a little bit of, I guess, market analysis and putting your feet in the water a little bit. And uh, you know every product is going to be different depending upon what kind of whether it's like I have a physical product. Some people have software or other ideas. Um, so should, you know who's going to buy it, and are you? Is it really feasible that you're going to generate sales from what you've created, uh, and is that worth pursuing? So I think that's about it. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to thank the panelists for joining us. It's, it's, uh, I think it's been really interesting and, and hopefully helpful to, to people out there. Again, we'll, we'll record this and we'll, we'll put it up on the interwebs um, for people to access later on so they could regale their children with the stories of it. Um, uh, with that said, there's, uh, there's two more events. Uh, we did mention SBIR, STTR funding. Uh, I think Abby brought that up at one point and there will be a panel that will kind of dig into how to secure some of that stuff. That'll be tomorrow at noon. And then, of course, the Innovation Awards is Thursday. So for all the panelists and everyone at Unimed, thank you very much for joining us. And we hope to see you again tomorrow.